All right, so this is the fall benchmark practice for Algebra 1. Um, this video was recorded 2019. There's our logo. There are 15 questions. There will also be 15 questions on the actual benchmark. Let's go over these. So, number one, um, I have to undo what's happening to x. Right now, 12 is being multiplied by x, so the inverse operation of multiply is to divide. So divide both sides by this number in front of x. Divide both sides by 12. And when I get that by itself, I'm left with x is equal to 3 twelfths. From here, I'm going to divide the top and bottom by the greatest coefficient, which is, or sorry, the greatest common factor. Um, so that's going to be 3 and 3. And when I do that, I'm going to get 1 over 4. A lot of students make a mistake on this one and think, oh, 3 divided by 12, that's just 4. It's 1 over 4. Um, number 2. Solve this inequality for n. So this one is pretty straightforward. I just need to undo what's happening to n. The inverse operation of minus 3 is plus 3. So I'm going to add 3 to both sides. And I'm left with 17 is less than n. Although if you want to flip this around so that n is first, then you can also say this is the equivalent of n is greater than 17. And you might be saying, wait, the symbol that used to be a less than, now it's a greater than. Why? Well, if you switch everything, and you're kind of reversing this in your mind, if you switch these two, then this sign has to flip as well. Otherwise, it doesn't preserve the inequality. I mean, think about that. That makes sense if I have one is definitely less than three. If I just switch one and three, then I have three is less than one. No, it's not. I have to switch this sign as well. All right, moving on to number three. Which inequality represents all possible solutions for this equation? So I just need to solve, essentially. And it's very similar to number one, where I have to undo the operation that's happening to D, I need to divide both sides by negative 12, divide both sides by negative 12. But when I divide or multiply by a negative, the sign here is going to flip. Instead of a greater than or equal to, it's a less than or equal to. And these 12s and negatives are canceled out. I have D on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I have negative 6 twelfths, and I divide the top and bottom by negative 6, divide by negative 6, and the negatives will therefore cancel out because a negative divided by negative is a positive, and 6 divided by 6 is 1, 12 divided by 6 is 2, so D is less than or equal to 1 half. D is less than or equal to positive 1 half, correct answer is C. All right, so number four, there are 221 students on a field trip. First, five students ride in a van, and then the rest of the students will fill six buses. So we first need to enter an equation that will solve for the number of students on each bus. So I, there's not enough room to enter it here, so I'm going to say, okay, for this one, I'm going to come down here. And first, I have to fill five students in a van. So I had 221 students, so I had students. I had 221, but then I have to subtract five because those are the ones that are going to go on the van. And then between this number now, I need to divide that by six because that is divided between six buses. So I divide by six and I have my answer. Finally, for this one, enter the number of students that are on each bus. Well, I just have to solve this now. 221 minus five, and I think you have a calculator on this one. If you don't, that's kind of mean. Um, I'm just gonna use my uh, spotlight search and I'm gonna say 221, I should use parentheses here. 221 minus five is 216 divided by six and I get 36. So this is equal to, so that was like the, the first box that you'd fill in, and then you actually solve that and you get six students. Or what did I say? 36 students per bus. Whew, there we go. Number five. All right, so we haven't learned these yet, and we won't learn them for another few months, so it's kind of a, an early problem. Um, notice that the different choices, they're all the same graph. The only difference in these options is that some of them are dashed line and some of them are solid lines. So the general rule of thumb is if I have a symbol that has an equal to sign like this, that is going to be a solid line. I'll write that here, solid line. And I have this in my room as well. It's in the back corner um, next to the Einstein poster, next to all of those Greek symbols. You can look up here. Um, and then if you have a no equal to sign, so like a greater than or just a sorry, a less than or a greater than symbol, then that is going to be a, you can call it a broken line or you can call it a dashed line, whatever you want to call it. I'll write both of them here. You can say broken line or you can say dashed line. Both of them are considered correct in my class at least. Um, that's when I don't have it equal to and that's just letting you know, hey, you're not allowed to touch that line. There's no answer on that line, but everything above that line is okay. So, you'll notice now that, okay, I can kind of see what's going on, but which line matches with which equation? Again, we haven't gotten to this unit until next. Um, this upcoming unit is when we're actually graphing like slope-intercept form, stuff like that. So the number that's in front of the x is the slope. 
So this equation right here has a slope of 5. This equation here has a slope of negative 2 fifths, because again, that's the number in front of the x, or what's known as the coefficient. So the coefficient tells you the steepness, and notice that if I have a, I'll give us some more notes down here, if I have a positive slope, if I have a positive slope, that means if I go from the left to the right, so if I drop a ball from the left to the right, the ball has to go uphill for a positive slope. But for negative slope, and I guess I don't need to have yellow here, I can just do green, negative slope, if I have negative slope, then if the ball is dropped on the left, it will go downhill. So this one goes downhill, and positive slope goes uphill. And just from that, you can tell, okay, well, one of them is negative, one of them is positive. So the one that's going downhill, this one is clearly a slope of negative two-fifths, and the one that's going uphill is clearly a slope of five. And I know that this doesn't have an equal to sign, so the one that has a slope of five, this one right here, should be a broken or a dashed line. So that one's okay. That one's okay. Oh, this one is not a dashed line. It's not C. This one doesn't have a dashed line. It's not D. Not C or D. Um, and then I go up here and I say, okay, the one that's downhill, this negative slope that's downhill, should have a solid line because it's a greater than, which is a solid line. So which of these has a solid line? Ah, it's not A, it's just B. So I'll fill in B. All right, so on to number six. So select the ordered pair that is a solution to the equation represented by the graph. This is a complex way of asking you, which of these points is on the line? So, 4, comma, 0. So if I go over 4, right 4, and then nothing, okay, well, that point is on the line. Check. Uh, 2 thirds, or 2, comma, 3. 2, comma, 3 is right there. Nope, that one's not on the line. It's close, but it's not on the line. 5, comma, 0. 5, comma, 0 is right here. That's nope on the line. A lot of people will make the mistake and say, oh, 5, 0, that's right there. No, that one, this point right here is 0, comma, 5. So that one isn't a multiple choice answer. And then finally, three comma two, three comma two. That one also isn't on the line, so nope, only A is on the line. All right, moving on to number seven. Ah, we have another similar question. So we need to find which of these actually represents the solution set. Again, we haven't got to this, so don't feel bad if you don't know how to do these, even after today's lesson. Um, so generally speaking, if I have a less than or a less than or equal to, that means I'm going to be under that line. And if I have a greater than or a greater than or equal, that means I'm going to be above or on top. So say above, I cannot spell above or on top. And this is under or bottom. And then I actually have to figure out which line is which. So notice that some of them are dashed, some of them are solid. So that's kind of the first giveaway. So again, it's the number in front of the x is the slope. So this says I have a positive slope. The positive slope, oops, I should see. The positive slope should have a solid line. The positive slope has a solid line, good. The positive slope has a, a dashed line. No, you're not it. Positive slope, solid line, positive slope, dashed line, no. Okay, so it's between C and A just because we know we have the correct dash and um, solid line. Again, they're both uh, dashed here, dashed here for the negative slope. So we know we're correct just on the dashed or dotted or dashed or solid lines. From here, now we have to figure out the difference between A and C is that one is above, one is below. So let's just purely look at this equation. This equation has a positive slope, so I'm looking at this line right here. This shaded area is below the line. And this is a less than. Less than is below the line, so the correct answer is A. And we'll see that uh, C is not correct because over here, this is the solid line and it's above the solid line. And again, because I have a less than, it should be below that line. So the correct answer is A. On to number eight. The graph shows the amount of gas in ounces in a lawnmower gas tank. So the gas is going lower and lower until you run out of gas. Model as a function of time. All right, so determine whether each statement is true according to the graph. Select true or false for each statement. So the maximum amount of the or the maximum amount of gas in the gas tank was 60 ounces. Well, I see 60 here, but that's a time because this axis represents time. In terms of the amount of gas, which is what this question is asking, the maximum looks like it only goes up to 30. It doesn't go up here to 60, so this one is false. The amount of gas in the gas tank at a maximum, or is at a maximum at zero minutes. Well, where is the highest point? Is the highest point here? No, the highest point is all the way back over here. When it does that happen? At time equals to 2010, zero. 
So that happens at zero minutes. So that's actually true. The maximum, the maximum height on this graph happens at zero minutes. And then finally, this one over here, um, the gas tank will be empty after 60 minutes. So after 60 minutes, we ran out of gas and the amount of gas is zero. That's what it's saying here. The amount of gas is zero after 60 minutes. Yeah, the amount of gas in terms of this axis is down here at zero after 60 minutes. So this one is also true. On to number nine. Bob and Nina make dog leashes. Oh yeah, so this problem. This one's going to be fun. Bob can make seven leashes in two hours and Nina can make four leashes in one hour. These sound like slopes to me. Something per something. Um, enter an equation that can be used to find the number of hours it takes Nina or Bob and Nina to make 60 leashes together. So yeah, so we basically need to add them together. So we have to add fractions and then convert it so that one of the it's going to be uh, the numerator because leashes per hour. So the numerator needs to be 60. So let's go ahead and add these together first. So I'm going to say um, 7 leashes per 2 hours is Bob. So I'm going to say this is going to be Bob here. This is going to be 7 leashes every 2 hours. And then Nina, I'll do that in yellow. Nina makes 4 leashes. L E A S. H E S leashes every uh, one hour. Oh, so it's a little bit faster than Bob. We need to add these together to see how fast they could make it. So I have to have like denominators. So what I need to do is I need to multiply Nina by two over two, and that's going to give us eight. I'm just going to do a lowercase cursive L for leashes over two hours. And now I can kind of ignore the yellow, and I can say, and also that too, I can say eight leashes per two hours and seven leashes per two hours. So in two hours, how many leashes can they make together? And essentially what I do when I add those, and I can write it separately, seven over two plus eight over two is seven plus eight is 15, 15 over two. The problem with that is I need to multiply this so that the top number is 60 leashes. Again, this is 15 leashes per two hours. I need to multiply, multiply the top, and I'll do this in uh, another color here. What am I? not using. I've used black, blue, yellow. I'm just going to circle back to, oh, I haven't used red. I need to multiply the top and bottom by some number such that I get 60 leashes per, I don't know how many hours. That's what the question is asking for. What goes in that box down here in hours? And you might know multiplication by 15 really well, but if you don't, you might have to do 60 divided by 15. And you would find, oh, that's four. So four and four. 15 times four is 60, if you don't believe me. 15 times four is indeed equal to 60. And I need to multiply the bottom by four as well, and that will give me my final answer of eight hours. So it's asking, how can I um, write an expression? So enter an equation that um, to find t hours it takes. So the general idea here is you can say seven halves plus eight, and you can even just do, you don't even have to make this fraction uh, different, you can just say plus um, four over one is equal to 60 over the time that you're looking for because again time came from down here. So that's the equation that you want to use For the first part and then enter the number of hours. It actually takes them to do 60 leashes That's the one that we just found uh, doing 8 per hour and this equation could have been different You could have been 7 has plus 8 over 2 is equal to 60 over t. That would also work Number 10 click in the appro uh, appropriate box to indicate the match of each table to its values in the equation. So again, this is one of those lessons that we just are doing this upcoming unit. So it's a little bit early, too early for us to do this, but I'll teach you quickly to do this question. But again, if you get it wrong, no worries, uh, no penalties. Um, there will be a slight penalty, I guess, in terms of your grade, in terms of a homework assignment for the other ones, the ones that you should know how to do. You should know how to do stuff like this, what's on the solution. You should know how to do problems like solving inequalities and stuff like that. Um, but this one, yeah, not so much. So let's go ahead and do uh, number 10. Um, so again, I have the slope, negative 4, slope is negative 4. Ah, oh, that slope is positive 4. The slope is how much you're going down in each table. By. I'm, I'm increasing by what divided by what. So on this table, I'm going up, and it's kind of hard to tell, but I'm going 3 fourths to 3 fourths. So ignore the 3 fourths. I'm going from 15 to 3, so I'm going down um, 12, minus 12, and I'm going... Um, minus four in that case, minus four, and then I'm doing minus four, and then down here I'm doing um, minus 12. And then on the left side, I can do this in yellow on this one, this one is 
Um, adding three, plus three, this one is plus one, this one is plus one, and this one is plus three. So it doesn't matter which one you choose, you could just do um, the first one. You could say this one is gonna be equal to the slope here, I should say slope for this one is gonna be negative 12, the delta y's, divided by the delta x's, which is positive three, the slope here is negative four. So this table has a slope of negative four, and again, the slope is the coefficient of the equation. So these both have negative four. So then the only difference over here is if it's a minus minus one-fourth, which is essentially plus one-fourth, or a plus minus one-fourth, which is just minus one-fourth for this one. So this happens at the um, y-intercept. This is in y-intercept, or slope-intercept notation. So I have to set the x value to zero. Notice how all of these has an x value equals zero. That is the intercept. And over here I have a negative one-fourth, this is the negative one-fourth, which means this table right here matches table C. So table C is the negative one-fourth slope, so this one is table C. What about table B? Notice that it's also decreasing in its, um, in its y values, in its f of x values, which means I should have a negative slope. So the only one that has a negative slope is up here. That one must be table B, and by process of elimination, this one must be table A. And you can tell that because we are actually increasing. To get from 4 to 16, I have to add 12. To get from 1 to 4, I'm adding 3, and then 12 divided by 3 is 4. So that matches up with the slope. And again, 0, 3 fourths. 3 fourths is the y-intercept. That all matches up. So I know I skipped over a lot of stuff, but we haven't quite learned how to do number 10 yet. But there it is. Number 11. So... Use the equation below to answer the question. Um, again, this is the type of thing that we haven't quite learned. Um, so all of these are correct. If I multiply 3 times x and 3 times 2, if I distribute here, I still get back to this form. And notice how all of these multiple choice answers are the same. But what do they highlight? So this, um, whenever you have it in this form, when you have just x inside the parentheses, it highlights the x-intercept. So it's not the y-intercept, it's not the y-intercept. This one highlights that the y-intercept is 6, by the way, if you have a question like that. This is the y-intercept is 6 in this type of notation. Whenever I have parentheses, that will highlight the x-intercept. And in this case, the x-intercept is always going to be opposite. Whenever you have parentheses, it's always going to be the opposite of whatever you have. So if I have a positive 2, I should have a negative 2. So the correct answer here is C. When I'm outside the parentheses, there are no parentheses, then it's just y-intercept is 6. So no parentheses. You're just equal to the number. With parentheses, you take the opposite. So it was a positive 2. It's now a negative 2. Number 12. Match each recursive function with the equivalent explicit function. So wow, I don't know when we talk about these in our class, but um, I'll teach you as best as I can. Um, this general rule over here is just saying keep adding 2. Add 2 over and over. In fact, just circle add 2 subtract 2 minus 3 over and over and over again. So if I subtract or if I add 2 over and over again, that's the same thing as saying I have a slope of 2. So think about a graph. I add 2. I add 2 more. I add 2 more. I add 2 more. That means I'm going up by a factor of 2 for every 1 that I go to the right. So this is going up 2, up 2, up 2. So the general rule of thumb back here is whatever this number is, that is the slope. And again, the slope is the number in front of the variable. So the slope here is 2. The slope here is negative 2, and the slope here is negative 3. It actually just made a nice, cute little diagonal in this case. So again, I'm matching these numbers to the coefficients of our equation, because those represent the slope. All right, number 13. Two types of membership are available for a water park. Unlimited for $70 a month, or monthly, which is $10 plus $5 per visit. So I need an equation that can be used to find the number of visits per month needed for the two membership types to cost the same amount. Whenever I see the word same, I'm thinking in my mind, an equal sign. They are the same. They are equal to each other. So I need to set one equal to the other. So, And I'm always talking about within a month, so ignore the um, $70 per month. It's just $70 for that month. So just $70. That, there it is. $70 for that month. But then V is visits. So I on the other side, I had $10 up front, but then $5 per visit. Whenever I have per visit, you need to be thinking about the multiplication symbol. So I need to add this other thing that's happening, $5 per visit. So it's gonna be five times, and then V means visit. So five times V, or just five V. And there's your equation. And that's all you need to do. You don't even need to solve it or anything. Um, number 14, second last problem. 
Um, which of these, is, again, this is a complicated way of asking which of these points are on this line. Negative 4, comma 4, negative 4, comma 4 is right here. Nope. Negative 2, comma 0, negative 2, comma 0 is right here. So that one works. Negative 2, comma 4, negative 2, comma 4 is right here. Nope. And 4, comma 0, 4, comma 0 is right here. So that one doesn't work. Again, this one is the, the tricky one because a lot of people are thinking, oh, um, 0, 4 is right here, right? No. Oh, sorry. 4, 0 is right here, right? 4, 0? No, this is 0, 4 for this point right here. Uh, I ran out of room here. I can grab all this and move it over and then say this is that point right, <laughs> right here. All right, our final problem. Ooh, let's do some reading. Jared creates a number sequence that has the first term of 2. All right, I'm going to write this down. His first term is 2, chunk. And then his second term is 5. Chunk. After each term, or each term after the second is created by subtracting the term before the previous term from twice the previous term. Am I reading that right? Subtracting the term before the previous term from twice the previous term. Wow, yeah, that sounds even hard to me. He uses S of t to denote each number t in the sequence. For example, S of 1 is equal to 2. So we say S of 1 is equal to 2, and S of 2, S of 2 is equal to 5. Which of the following can be used to find the value of s of n for anything that's greater than 2? And again, it says every term after the second, so any n greater than 2, those two match up, so don't worry about that as much. So the key thing is, how do I interpret this line right here into some sort of pattern? So generally speaking, if I have s of n minus 1, the way that I translate that is I say that is the previous term previous term. And if I have something like um, s of n minus 2, that's like two terms ago. And how do they say that up here? They say um, before the previous term. So I'll translate that as before previous term or two times ago. So before previous term. And another way of thinking that is two terms ago. So I'll say or two terms ago. And similarly if I do s of n minus 3, that's three terms ago, or the term before the term that's before the previous term, which is kind of a hard way of saying it. Alright, so we know what's happening in terms of the translation. So if I say by subtracting, so keyword here is subtracting the term before the previous term. So subtracting the term before the previous term, so I'm just going to be subtracting s of n minus 1. So which of these says, says minus n minus 1? Um, by subtracting the term, oh, this is the term before the previous term. I'm sorry, I, I misread that. The term before the previous term, that is this one, term before the previous term. So which one is just merely subtracting s of n minus 2? Um, s of n minus 2, I see I'm subtracting here. That's it? No. The correct answer is D. Um, and then he's also saying and subtracting from twice the previous term. Twice the previous term is two times this previous term. And two times the previous term, two times the previous term. So there it is. Um, yeah, so correct answer is D. I'm sorry that was so confusing. Um, and that concludes our uh, benchmark practice.